Hi, my name is Dana Loberg. I'm a history major from Yale University, and I'm excited to share a new perspective on our human history, the history of us. You may know me as the co-founder of Leo AR, a mobile app, and also the proud author of a children's book series called The Golden Castle Healers. As an entrepreneur in technology, I have a keen interest in exploring the various possibilities of our past. I love science and philosophy, and I'm coming up with new ideas and possibilities because I think it's more fun to think outside the box. I hope that you will find this version of our history intriguing and approach it with an open mind, as it may challenge some of the traditional narratives that we are accustomed to hearing. In our episode of Mythology and Human, we've already covered the basics of mythology. Now we're going to explore it further. We'll talk about the gods and goddesses, their relationships, and what happens as a result of these relationships. Experts like Pavlov and Campbell have studied this topic thoroughly, will offer a fresh new perspective. Some YouTube content creators discuss mythology with different aspects. They compare it to modern religions, suggesting that these religions might have borrowed from ancient myths. Some viewers might accept these ideas as truth, which we've already discussed in a previous video. Today, we see elements of ancient pagan beliefs in many areas. That's why anyone trying to educate others should understand mythology and recognize mythological themes. If not, they might unintentionally support outdated pagan ideas while trying to teach. If you're interested in history, you might know about the links between Christianity and paganism. It might be hard to believe that Christianity was influenced by pagan practices, but when you look at the symbols and stories, it's clear there's a connection. We'll go into more detail in our video. We'll also tackle the claim that religious stories are just copied from mythology, showing why this isn't true. Our goal is to clear up some misconceptions in this area. When we study the weird history of mythology, we come across the Homeric hymns. These are ancient texts that someone once claimed to have discovered and then written down. The Homeric Hymns, a book that is now about 200 pages long and found in many libraries, was first written down in 1488. However, we've never been able to find the original ancient text that this book is based on. What happened next? During the Enlightenment, the number of mythological stories began to grow rapidly. Initially, there were about 15 gods mentioned in early text, but this number eventually soared to over 300 as new stories were written. There were even debates about who Zeus's child was. Who is Hesoid? It is known that Hesoid was an old peasant and considered the father of Greek didactic poetry. Legend has it that he was inspired to write poetry by some kind of fairies while he was tending a sheep on a hillside. Let's assume that Hesoid, inspired by these fairies, writing a mythological text in the 700s BC. But here's the catch. His work was only turned into the book we know in 1488, over two millennia later. And we don't have original manuscript, we just have claims of his transcription. About 500 years after this book, mythology started to get really confusing with the addition of new stories. I'll explain soon why this confusion happened. We're observing the ongoing influence of paganism, and we can't ignore the role of the Opus Dei organization, which emerged during the Enlightenment. They believed in the idea of returning to our roots, and their opposition to the Vatican led them to embrace the mythological ideas. Opus Dei understood that stories shape our lives and beliefs. A person needs to know the requirements of their faith and how they should live to maintain a regular lifestyle. In the past, there was a cosmology story narrated by Hesoid. For those curious, cosmos means the world and theos means God. He argues that God created a universe out of chaos. Does this remind you of anything? Until the 1980s, schools taught chaos theory. It was taught that at a moment when everything was in disarray, an explosion caused dust particles to come together over time to form the Earth. This fabricated physics narrative continued until the 80s. However, it is now universally clear that order cannot arise from chaos. Controlled chaos is not possible. In short, until the 80s, the man who wrote the creation for the scientific world was Hesoid. This narrative continued even in universities. Despite adopting there is no God notion, the European world included the mythological narrative of a man who generated legends and myths into their educational system. About Hesoid, it is said, quote, deciphering Hesoid's cosmology is quite difficult. What he meant is still debated, unquote. Today, we generally see the educational counterparts of this statement. If you can't solve something, leave it to be. If there is chaos somewhere, don't trouble your mind with it. If you can't decipher the depths of a topic, don't overthink about it. Without understanding the origins of life, it's hard for people to grasp their purpose or what they should live for. Now we are faced with a dogmatic generation. Today, some universities are even worse than the papacy. For centuries, educational institutions taught that the earth formed from a cosmic dust cloud. 
Students couldn't easily challenge their teachers by asking, how do you know that? There's an unspoken rule that you shouldn't question university professors. While young people might debate with religious leaders, they often stay quiet in university lectures, worried about losing grades or being kicked out of class for dissenting views. Sadly, this is a reality in some schools. We're now confronting what some call a civilization steeped in a kind of pagan ignorance. The ancient polytheistic beliefs once held by Greek farmers have seeped into modern thinking. The truth is that a chaotic process cannot create the world. Order does not arise from chaos. The universe operates on specific codes and laws. Observations from the Hubble Space Telescope launched in the 1980s show that the universe isn't in a state of chaos. There's a clear beginning through opinions differ on whether this points to a creator or a random event. Some scientists suggest the universe's existence is a stroke of coincidence. But scientifically, coincidence isn't a satisfactory explanation. The universe follows the laws of physics, mathematics, geometry, biology, etc. Nothing arises without a reason, even if we don't yet understand it. The process of how something comes into being may not be known at the moment, but this does not mean the formation is due to coincidence. Using the term coincidence instead of we cannot know indicates that the scientific world is contaminated with a dogmatic understanding. Indeed, the phrase we cannot know leans toward agnosticism, which some in the scientific community might avoid because it suggests the possibility of a divine creator. This opens the door for religious scientists in academic circles, potentially challenging the dominance of an aesthetic perspective that often dismisses religious explanations as mere myth. Ironically, the atheistic stance, which tends to view religions as collections of stories, may itself be unknowingly rooted in a kind of mythological narrative. For the scientific community to maintain a purely atheistic identity, it must avoid acknowledging any connection to mythological or religious explanations. Admitting that their understanding might be influenced by mythology would undermine the purely empirical image that science strives to uphold. Now let's discuss some mythological stories. Hesoid talks about a massive explosion that led to chaos, from which four gods emerged, including Gaia, the Earth Mother. The origins of these gods are not clearly explained. Eros is seen as a savior in mythological sources, with his name deriving from the Latin word hero. However, there's a peculiarity. Eros is not mentioned in the earliest mythological sources being added later in this narrative form. Eros is the one of the most erotic among the gods. In contemporary culture, the allure and traits of mythological figures like Eros can be seen in characters like from Marvel comics and movies, where heroes are often depicted as attractive and powerful. Filmmakers are still producing the same mythology. Eros conveys this message to young minds. Creativity, innovation, and the journey to capture novelty are possible through your erotic powers. The more sexually oriented your life is, the more creative you become. This idea has permeated the arts, where sexuality is frequently associated with creativity, leading to widespread nudity and a focus on erotic themes. The implication is that to be innovative and open-minded, one must embrace all aspects of existence, including those that are sexual. Such perspectives have shifted emotions and values from the heart to more base instincts, aligning with a new paganistic approach where sexuality is not just for pleasure, but a duty emulating the gods' behaviors. According to this view, an innovative person should be open to everything, even nudity. Unfortunately, this is an epidemic of intelligent problems our era faces. The erotic concept introduced by Eros surrounds us all. This approach has not only stripped of off our clothes, but also corrupted people's eyes, ears, and hearts. Pornography, gossip, and selfishness have surrounded us. We now crave the old piece of true love experienced in our hearts. Mythology is filled with stories of gods engaging in relationships with their children, a theme that disturbingly finds echoes in the high rates of incestuous relationships in some modern societies like Finland, where recent studies indicate alarmingly high rates. This suggests that mythological narratives influence moral and ethical standards, normalizing behaviors that are generally considered taboo. Today, recent studies indicate that the rate of incestuous relationships in Finland is 47%. For a person to engage in an incestuous relationship, their conscience must be at ease with the situation, which requires a belief system rooted in mythology. The mes message mythology tries to impart to the human body today is, do something, let what you do be a part of you, let it reproduce from you, and eventually serve your every purpose. The European world history of slavery and colonialism was also made possible through this mythological understanding. Nowadays, we often mix up the divine and the human. 
People are claiming to be divine themselves while trying to make God more human-like. This idea comes from ancient pagan and polytheistic beliefs, but the idea of a God who acts like a human doesn't really make sense. People now carry a Gaia within them, believing they are the sole architects of their actions. Even though we can't control our own brain's neurons, we like to believe we come up with every thought on our own. When parents see themselves as godlike, their children start to think of themselves as divine too, expecting their wishes to be granted immediately. Kids are choosing their own paths, setting aside their family's traditions, trying to create their own Olympuses, just like Zeus did in his time. As a result, without realizing it, our society is starting to resemble the heroes from those old myths. In these stories, the god of the underworld, Tartarus, is similar to the idea of hell. It's natural to think about death when we're caught up in seeking pleasure because death is something everyone will face eventually. But in these myths, death is always considered scary for humans and the afterlife is never shown as a good place. This viewpoint has led people to think of God as harsh and unloving, even though we value honesty and love in our own relationships. They believe they are more compassionate than God. However, we believe God does not act this way. This belief stems from humans elevating themselves to godlike status. The arbitrary penalties handed out by gods and myths have made people think that God and religion is also without mercy. However, punishment can sometimes come from a place of love. For example, when a parent disciplines their child is to help correct their mistakes. The system of punishment is also a necessity for a child's education. To provide a metaphorical example, turning a piece of wood into a pencil requires putting it through various processes and sanding it down, which could be seen as a form of punishment from the wood's perspective. Of course, God's system of punishment is not like this example. For humans, punishment applies to those who refuse to be shaped, to be refined by love until the moment of death. Mythology includes stories about demons and magical beings called genies as well. It tells us that Aphrodite, who is considered the devil's daughter, was born from Gaia and Uranus. After her, the Hecatoncharis were born. Then came the Cyclops, who are like genies, and the Titans, who represent different races. In these stories, Noah's 12 children are depicted as Titans. But it's important to note that these specific terms weren't used during the time of Homer and were added later to make the stories fit with religious teachings. Some people saw the similarities between these mythological tales and religious stories and thought that religions might have originated from mythology. However, these stories were actually written later on. In Greek mythology, cyclopses are depicted as giant creatures with a single eye in the center of their foreheads, considered the least attractive among the gods. They are famed for constructing the magnificent palace on Olympus. This mythological narrative drew inspiration from religious stories like those of prophets David and Solomon, who commanded genies to build grand structures for them. Why do mythological tales include genies and demons? It's because there was a common belief that ancient figures known as prophets could harness the power of genies and perform miracles. Skeptics of religion acknowledging these stories said, we want to do the same and thus wove these elements into mythology, merging them with their understanding of life. Some children are more sensitive to spiritual phenomena and can perceive things that are invisible to others. For these children, cartoon characters like Casper the Friendly Ghost were a form of encouragement and support. It is also well known that within Freemasonry and various sects, some individuals communicate with genies and demons. Every story we hear or read touches our lives in some way. In the Western world, a hero is often someone who rejects what they've inherited from their ancestors and tries to become their own god. In mythology, beings become gods in winning wars. These stories don't focus on love, generosity, or giving. Instead, they're filled with tales of betrayal, battles, and desire, showing how killing others could win a spot in Olympus, a place in the God's world. This idea is similar to how capitalism started. Until next time.